Good morning and welcome to worship with us this day. We're so glad that you're able to join us this day as we worship our Lord. This day we continue with sharing our virtual pulpit and so we are so glad to be able to re welcome Reverend Laura Ann Phillips. She is a Disciples of Christ minister and serves at Overland Park Christian Church in Overland Park, Kansas. We're so thankful for the ability to be able to share our pulpit like this this morning. Let us begin with the call to worship that comes to us from Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed, O you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. Let us pray. Loving God, we come before you this day, the day you have made, some rejoicing and being glad in it, and others hoping for the day joy returns. Yet no matter whether we come with joy or the hope of future joy, your loving faithfulness to us remains the same. Thank you, Lord, not just for this day, for your steadfast love that surrounds us always. In your name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn for this morning is Immortal, Invisible, God Only Love. into a time of worship, we come humbly before our God, knowing that our God is quick to forgive the sins that we are so willing to confess. And so let us fall before our Maker, confessing our wrongdoings against God and against neighbor, knowing that God is quick to forgive. Let us join together in the prayer of confession. Lord, too often we speak without pausing to seek your wisdom. We assume our own goodness and fail to question our limited knowledge and understanding. We hurt others with our hasty, often well-intended words and actions. We falsely believe our ways are your ways and condemn those who disagree with us. In this tumultuous time, turn us toward you Remove the scales from our eyes and give us ears to hear your guidance. Do not let our need for earthly approval sway our commitment to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Forgive our failings. 
take our faltering attempts at faithfulness and use them to lead us to your paths of righteousness. Amen. Hear these words of forgiveness. Therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Friends, believe this astounding good news. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. The scripture for this morning comes to us from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. This is the word of our Lord, to whom we give our thanks and praise. The Dutch theologian and former prime minister, Abraham Kuyper, wrote a treatise on common grace and in this treatise, he advances the idea that God's gifts, including those of artistic talent, are lavished on all of humanity, whether the artists are believers or not, whether they're painting a portrait of Christ or say, sewing a costume on a Muppet, the art they each create falls beneath God's sovereignty. Reflections of God's grace and God's revealing truth can be found in the most unexpected places. Having an entire worship series on the melding of art and understanding, of film and faith, may make some squeamish. But don't we often confess that God and God's presence are not limited to the most obvious places or the most obvious times in our lives? Just as holding a prism against a slit of sunlight reveals a variety of colored beams, a look at various movies and their conversations with society have the capacity to help God and God's purposes shimmer for us in new ways. Throughout history, Christians have argued about where we can find the truest sense of God's self, or where we can see the truest truth about God. To some degree, all Christians proclaim that the truest truth about God comes in God with us, Emmanuel, Jesus the Christ. But even then, where and how do we learn the most about Christ? Certainly, we learn much from reading scripture, but if we place God, if we place our entire understandings of God on scripture alone, then we're likely missing the presence of God that we experience out in nature and God's very gifts right in front of us. Surely, like Jacob who found God in a wrestling match, we too can declare that surely God was in this place in stories and places we never would have imagined. To that end, we continue with our series about finding God in the movies. In particular, some movies that have shaped our culture for many years. This morning's movie is certainly one that has shaped culture, one that you cannot ignore, even if you've never seen one minute of it. Star Wars, or retroactively titled Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, first came out in theaters on May 25, 1977. The series, extending its influence to nearly every corner of the earth, has produced 11 full-length feature films. The most recent, Episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker, was released just a few months ago in December 2019. In 1989, this first Star Wars film, A New Hope, was selected by the U.S. Library of Congress for preservation in the National Film Registry for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. And today, it is regarded as one of the most important films in the history of motion picture. The whole saga, all 11 movies, are a space opera about the eternal struggle between good and evil, in which both sides are able to use this mystical energy called the Force, described as an energy field created by all living things that surrounds us, penetrates us, and binds the galaxy together. Quite simplistically, the Jedi used the light side of the Force for good, and the Sith used the dark side for evil. 
When Star Wars first came out in 1977, our world, and especially the United States, comprised a people with wavering hope. The turbulent 1960s, Vietnam, racial unrest, and generational discord, as well as the 70s with the Watergate scandal, rising crime, energy crisis, and nuclear family breakdown, left millions with life and, de with life and desperation for a brighter future. George Lucas even said, the whole emotion I am trying to get at the end of the film is for you to be emotionally and spiritually uplifted and to feel absolutely good about life. It almost seems as if I could rewrite that paragraph for today. The turbulent early 2000s with ongoing wars in the Middle East and conflict with China and Russia, racial unrest and generational discord, just as with the dark mid 2000s with its 2008 recession, political scandal, rising gun violence, energy crisis, and changing nuclear family dynamics has all left millions disillusioned with life and desperate for a brighter future. Enter Star Wars, A New Hope. In the first installment of Star Wars, we see the story of Luke Skywalker and the beginning of his journey into becoming a Jedi to save the galaxy from the evil Darth Vader and the Galactic Empire. When we first meet Luke, he's a farm boy living on a backwater planet in the outer rim of the galaxy, and he's got big dreams. He wants to be a pilot and join the rebellion against the Empire. But he can't leave because his aunt and his uncle need him to help with harvest on their moisture farm. He desperately wants something more out of his life, but his dreams keep getting shot down. Until one day, two droids, R2-D2 and C-3PO, come upon their farm and Luke finds out that they are carrying a secret message to this strange guy, Obi-Wan Kenobi, who was once a war hero, general, and Jedi Knight, but is now living as a hermit on the same planet that Luke is on. While there are possibly hundreds of directions I could go with the discussion of faith from the perspective of Star Wars, I want to focus on the relationship between Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi, or old Ben in this particular first movie. We start to see Luke realize his identity through Obi-Wan, who knows his history, knows his father, and knows that Luke is capable of much more than he realizes. Before this, the most Luke expected of his life is that best case scenario, maybe someday he'd be able to enter the academy. But here we learn through Obi-Wan that Luke is destined for greater things. Obi-Wan sees Luke and opens Luke's eyes to a whole new galaxy of possibility. Throughout this movie, we see them develop a strong mentoring relationship. Obi-Wan is level-headed, cool, and he has this era of gravitas and experience that draws you in to this relationship. He's patient with Luke, but at the same time challenges him to really stretch out of his comfort zone. He sees the potential in Luke, but he can't just give him that lightsaber and say, go fight Darth Vader. It's a process built on trust and faith to push Luke in new ways. Throughout scripture, we see the importance of mentorship and relationship that call us to greater truths and greater versions of ourselves. Jethro and Moses in Exodus 18, Moses and Joshua in Deuteronomy 34, Naomi and Ruth in the first chapter of Ruth, Elizabeth, Elizabeth and Mary in Luke chapter one, Paul and Barnabas in Acts, and Paul and Timothy in Acts, Philippians, and First and Second Timothy. And of course, Jesus and all of his disciples and his followers. Part of the reason we call ourselves into relationship with one another and with a faith community is that we recognize the power in relationship that can change us, stretch us out of our comfort zones, and ensure the growth of God's reconciling love. In John 14, we see the relationship between God Christ and the Advocate, and understand the power that can come from a true relationship rooted in the love that created this world. As we ponder these different examples of relationship, I invite you to focus more specifically on Ephesians 4, in which Paul encourages the church in the ways that we are all called to different kinds of relationships, and that we are all called at different times for different situations. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, 
His purpose was to equip God's people for the work of serving and building up the body of Christ until we all reach the unity of faith and knowledge of God's Son. God's goal is for us to become mature adults, to be fully grown, measured by the standard of the fullness of Christ. Where is God calling these leaders in this exact moment in time? God has given us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers in relationship with one another so that together we can live out the fullness of Christ. But who is God calling to speak at this moment? And who is God inviting to listen? When we hear leaders choosing to speak out on issues that might make us feel uncomfortable, issues like systemic racism or what has occurred around the world in terms of protest against systemic racism. When you hear people in your congregation, maybe even your pastor, speaking out on topics that are uncomfortable and you want to check out because church should be about feeling comfortable and peaceful, remember that you are in relationship with your pastor and that as Christians together, you are both mentor and mentee to and with one another. Pastors and religious leaders do not speak out because they are speaking partisan politics, but because these are theological issues. We speak out because we believe what is taking place is an affront to the justice priorities of the Bible, an affront to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, an affront to the imago dei, image of God, found in all of humanity. We speak out because we are in relationship with people for whom we hope the best, and with whom we together seek the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. If you trust clergy enough to baptize your kids, share in your vows at your wedding, sit by your bed when you are ill, lift your family in prayer, counsel you through deep valleys, and commit you to the earth when you are dead. And if you trust us enough to lead you in study of scripture, preach the word in worship, and administer the sacraments, then I also invite you to trust us to point out when moments when our leaders, our institutions, and our society are working in direct opposition to what is taught in the life-giving scriptures that we read together. Like Luke and Obi-Wan, we form a relationship based on trust. We trust and love you. We don't want to incur your anger or make you unhappy. And at the same time, if we don't proclaim these things when it really matters, how can you trust us to do any of that regular stuff? It's all bound together, like it says in Ephesians. Preacher, pastor, prophet. If church can't be all of our calling together, then those other parts wither when those are called down. In the same way that we start to see Luke realize his identity through Obi-Wan, who knows his history, knows his father, and knows that Luke is capable of much more than he realizes. Let us together, with one another, for one another, remember our history, remember God's liberation, and recall that we are called to so much more for and with all who follow the Christ with us. May it be so. Amen. We come to a time of sharing our joys and concerns with one another and lifting them up to God. And so as we enter into this holy time of prayer, we ask what joys and concerns do you have to lift up this day? We ask that you please leave them in the comment section or email the church and we will add them to our prayer list and keep them in our God, 
we enter this time of prayer mindful of our inability to be content. We are restless and dissatisfied even when we have all we need and then some. Instead of giving thanks for that which we have, we lament that which we feel we lack. We burden ourselves with things that do not offer that which they promise. We burden others with expectations they cannot possibly meet. We burden creation with our relentless abuse of the earth and its creatures. As we pause to acknowledge our total dependence on you, reveal to us the abundance you pour out upon your people. We rejoice in the myriad of colors that you that show your glory around every corner. The green leaves on the trees, the orange and purples and pinks of blooming flowers, the flash of red cardinal and that shiny black of the crow. Help us to stop and notice the beauty you so lavishly create and share. We celebrate the goodness you embed in humanity. We look for the helpers, the healers, the teachers, mentors, leaders, and encouragers who spend their lives looking to the interests of others, seeking to serve rather than be served. We give thanks for those closest to us, the people who love us at our worst, cheer us when we are at our lowest, care for us when we are at our weakest, and want what is best for us. They show us what it means to be called beloved and significant. We praise you for the gift of this day, whatever it entails, knowing that you are present with us, that Christ prays for us, that the Spirit intercedes for us. We rest in these promises so that emboldened by your power, we can share these truths with those yet to know of their priceless worth in your eyes. We lament the suffering so pervasive in our world. We cry out with sighs too deep for words for those who go to bed hungry, the people fearing for their lives, the vulnerable too long exploited, and your children denied justice. We lift up to you the sick and the brokenhearted, the lonely and the impoverished, and we are yoked to Christ. Yoke us to those who need their burdens lightened and their souls refreshed. We make our prayer in the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We enter into a time of giving thanks to our Lord and offering a part of our blessings and ourselves back for we own nothing. Everything belongs to the Lord. And yet God gifts us with resources that are too, that we too steward and share. As we present to God this morning's offerings, we remember with thanksgiving the Lord's overflowing goodness and mercy. And we give accordingly. Let us give thanks to the Lord. Let us pray. 
Lord, as the wild flowers bloom on the side of the highway and the birds sing in the summer dawn, we rejoice in the beauty of creation that surrounds us, no matter the upheaval around and within us. Take these offerings of ours given in faith, bless and use them to reveal your glory, your beauty, your goodness and your grace to those deepest in need of knowing they are beloved and cherished by no less than you. God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn for this morning is We All Are One in Mission. Beloved, go from this place praising God, who sends us into the world to proclaim the gospel and to work for justice and peace. Give yourself over to God's wise and gracious rule, knowing that God can be trusted to make all things work together for good, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please share a sign of peace.